My name is David, and I shall recount the tale of my existence. From my earliest days, I sensed the hand of destiny guiding me. Raised amidst the pastoral beauty of Bethlehem, where the fields stretch wide under the expanse of clear skies, I, Esai, found myself entrusted with the care of my father's sheep. Yet, to me, this was not merely a vocation, it was a divine calling. Each dawn, I would lead the flock to verdant pastures, ensuring their safety and well-being while fending off the menacing threats of lions and bears. Through these perilous encounters, I learned not only the art of defense but also came to believe in a higher power guiding my steps. One fateful evening, as the sun descended, cloaking the heavens in hues of orange and gold, an unexpected visitor arrived, heralding a profound shift in my destiny. Samuel, the revered prophet, journeyed to Bethlehem upon divine summons. As the youngest among my father's sons, I was anointed as the chosen vessel, though my stature paled in comparison to my siblings. For in the eyes of the Almighty, it is the purity of heart that holds sway. Lost in contemplation amidst the tranquil grazing of the sheep, I beheld a congregation gathering, bathed in the sun's benevolent rays. Little did I realize that this day marked the commencement of an extraordinary odyssey, a transformation from humble shepherd to anointed king, orchestrated by the divine hand. Guided by an inner whisper, akin to the rustle of leaves in the wind, I hastened homeward. There, in the presence of Samuel, a venerable figure exuding wisdom accrued through the passage of years, I felt a potent mixture of awe and trepidation gripping my soul. Samuel, the conduit of divine will, declared his purpose, to anoint the chosen monarch of Israel from among the sons of Esai. And though my stature seemed insignificant amidst my towering brethren, I stood before him, a vessel of divine favor. One by one, my brothers passed before Samuel, each possessing commendable attributes and strengths, yet none elicited the divine confirmation. Until, at last, Samuel inquired, Are these all your sons? It was then that my father remembered my absence, summoning me from the fields. As I entered, a hushed anticipation fell upon the room, with some casting incredulous glances, while others gazed upon me with wonder. Yet Samuel, with a gaze that seemed to penetrate the depths of my being, bestowed upon me the sacred blessing, anointing my head with oil. In that moment, a profound sensation engulfed me, a mingling of reverence and exultation, as if a divine flame ignited within my soul, marking the inception of a sacred journey ordained by the heavens. The words spoken by Samuel resounded not only within the confines of our humble abode but also within the depths of my very being. The impact of those words upon me was profound, sealing my destiny. I transitioned from the humble vocation of a shepherd to the exalted position of a chosen leader destined to govern Israel. It was a defining moment, not only in the eyes of the people but also in the sight of the divine, where true authority resides. The proclamation resounded, declaring, Behold, the chosen one of the Lord. It was then that I came to the realization that God's designs are veiled in mystery and he selects the most improbable and unexpected individuals to aid in the fulfillment of his divine purposes. Thus concluded my personal narrative, henceforth, I would serve and lead according to the guidance of the one who discerns the innermost depths of the human heart. There was a discernible shift in the atmosphere on my return journey to the pastures that day. Though the surroundings remained unaltered, an internal transformation had transpired. In that moment, I bore both a weighty burden and a resplendent promise. My future would be woven with threads of adversity and triumph, suffering and glory. As the Anointed One, I bore the name of David, and the mantle of kingship over Israel was draped upon my shoulders by divine decree. Guided by the hand of God, I navigated the intricate pathways of my existence. Despite continuing to engage in activities I cherished, tending to my flock, composing psalms, and playing the harp, an inner metamorphosis was underway. 
the assurance and promise that the Lord harbored grand designs for my life kindled a flame within me, illuminating the path of destiny. My heart stirred with a profound sense of purpose and calling. As days melded into weeks and weeks into months, I pondered the significance of that momentous encounter. Beneath the expansive skies of Bethlehem, though I remained David, son of Jesse, shepherd of sheep, a new narrative was being inscribed upon the annals of my life. I was ordained to live out and proclaim that narrative, requiring courage and acceptance on my part. Following the anointing that irrevocably altered the course of my existence, I resumed my customary endeavors. Yet, ere long, a new chapter of my destiny unfolded. News of my skillful harp playing traversed the verdant hills and distant valleys, reaching the august chambers of power, where King Saul languished under the torment of a malevolent spirit. In an endeavor to assuage the monarch's anguish, his counselors proposed the introduction of a musician endowed with the gift to soothe through melody. A servant maiden, having borne witness to my musical prowess and disseminated word thereof, facilitated the burgeoning of my renown. Thus, while amidst the azure expanse above Bethlehem, I acceded to the summons to serve in Saul's court. This decision was not made lightly, it signified my commitment to minister to the man who would succeed me as the ruler of Israel. Unbeknownst to all, my ascension to the throne had been divinely ordained, a sacred irony, a tapestry of fate whose intricate weave would unfold with the passage of time. Anticipation and curiosity rippled through the court as my arrival approached. I stood poised to perform before the potent yet vulnerable King of Israel. Understandably, trepidation gripped my heart. Now accustomed to the strings of the harp, I endeavored to craft melodies that would not only console but also heal. At the onset of the recital, a palpable serenity permeated the hall. It became evident that music possessed a profound power, an omnipresent language that spoke directly to the soul. Meanwhile, Saul's countenance underwent a transformation as the harmonies wafted through the air. A palpable tranquility descended upon him, and the burden he bore appeared to momentarily dissipate. In that moment, Music forged an extraordinary and unforeseen connection between the future king of Israel and his predecessor. It erected an unseen bridge that spanned the chasm between us. Frequent visits to the royal court became an integral part of my routine, as Saul and I gradually cultivated a bond of trust. My role extended beyond that of a mere singer. I served as a beacon of companionship, bringing solace to the king amidst his darkest days. Yet beneath the surface of our connection lay a labyrinth of intricacies, interwoven fates whose complexities deluded our full comprehension. The pivotal moment when I could aid Saul marked a transformative juncture in my life, unveiling insights into the workings of human nature, the political dynamics of the court, and the intricate nexus between power and loyalty. Foremost among the lessons gleaned was the profound realization of music's transcendental potency, capable of dismantling the unseen barriers that divide us, uniting hearts in moments of unadulterated humanity. My tenure within Saul's court proved pivotal for my artistic and leadership development, notwithstanding the myriad challenges and enigmatic occurrences that punctuated those days. Anticipating the arduous path ahead, replete with peaks and troughs, consonants and discord akin to the melodies I rendered, I gleaned invaluable lessons in resilience. As the shepherd, minstrel, and anointed one, I assumed the mantle of David, intimately intertwined with the destiny of Israel. Within the precincts of Saul's court, I gleaned first-hand insights into the daunting specter of Goliath that loomed large over the Israelite ranks. When the towering behemoth brazenly challenged our forces, paralyzing them with fear, none dared to confront him. None, that is, until I, though young and unassuming, resolved to confront the giant propelled not by recklessness, but by unwavering faith in the Almighty. My decision to confront Goliath elicited skepticism and indifference from many quarters, including King Saul himself, 
who perceived me as a mere stripling presuming to down the mantle of a warrior. Yet, fortified by a faith unyielding, I declined the monarch's offer of conventional armaments, for my strength derived not from forged metal but from an unshakable trust in the divine. As I approached the battlefield, armed solely with a sling and a handful of smooth stones culled from a babbling brook, the formidable figure of Goliath, bedecked in fearsome armor and brandishing a spear, scorned me. Mocking my youth and the simplicity of my weaponry, he failed to discern that I came not to showcase personal prowess, but to manifest the might of the God of Israel. Every utterance directed at Goliath bore not only the veneer of valor but also the bedrock of faith. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. With a tranquility bestowed only by celestial assurance, I hurled a solitary stone from my sling, striking Goliath squarely on the forehead and felling him to the earth. The vanquishing of Goliath heralded not merely the demise of a mortal foe but the shattering of the Philistines' illusion of invincibility. That epical moment, etched indelibly in memory, served as a watershed for the Israelites, infusing them with renewed vigor and faith to confront their adversaries. Beyond its martial ramifications, my triumph over Goliath catapulted me into the realm of leadership in the eyes of the populace, anointed as a steadfast servant of God. With crystalline clarity, I apprehended that my trajectory was inexorably intertwined with the divine design. To traverse this path demanded not only physical fortitude but unwavering fidelity to the Most High's will. The aftermath of Goliath's defeat unfurled a tapestry of unexpected opportunities, including newfound entree into the hitherto inaccessible precincts of King Saul's court. Amidst the welter of acclaim and approbation, one alliance assumed singular significance, my burgeoning friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son, marking the genesis of a bond unparalleled in history. In Jonathan, I discovered not a rival nor a threat but a kindred spirit, united in purpose, courage, and, above all, unswerving faith in God. Amidst the intrigues and machinations that beset the court, our camaraderie blossomed into an impregnable bastion of loyalty and fraternal love. Our connection transcended mere words, finding expression in deeds and sacrifices. In a gesture at once poignant and selfless, Jonathan bestowed upon me his own accoutrements, attire, weaponry, and regalia, a symbolic testament to the recognition of my station and the enduring pledge of allegiance. Though by law he stood heir to Saul's throne, he relinquished his claim in deference to the divine ordination he discerned in me. In the grand halls of the court, a bond formed between Jonathan and me, a bond that held immense significance amidst the intrigues and complexities that surrounded us. Jonathan was not merely a mentor but also a steadfast defender, a bridge to King Saul himself. In him, I found a kindred spirit, someone who understood the weight of duty and the trials that accompanied it. Through the tumultuous currents of courtly life, Jonathan's unwavering support served as an anchor, grounding me in times of adversity. As the corridors of power grew fraught with danger, my friendship with Jonathan became a bastion of solace. It stood as a testament to the enduring strength of genuine companionship, reminding me that amidst the allure of success and the clamor of fame, true bonds forged in love and mutual respect endure. The story of our friendship stands as a beacon, illuminating the transformative power of authentic relationships and shaping destinies. In an age where deceit and selfish ambition often cloud human interactions, our friendship remains a steadfast testament to the timeless virtues of loyalty and shared purpose. Jonathan's influence extended beyond mere camaraderie, he imparted unto me invaluable lessons on the essence of nurturing meaningful connections with others. His guidance resonated deeply within me, shaping not only my leadership but also my character. Amidst the opulent confines of the palace, a shadow began to loom, a harbinger of the turmoil that would soon engulf us. It was the shadow of Saul's dwindling favor, 
a consequence of the accolades and victories bestowed upon me by the Lord. As Saul's heart soured with envy and fear, I witnessed the erosion of his trust and affection towards me. The accolades sung by the people, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands, served as the catalyst for Saul's descent into bitterness and suspicion. Each word of praise aimed at me pierced Saul's pride like a poison arrow, festering within him and fueling his growing animosity. Where once there was camaraderie and trust, now lay a chasm of mistrust and hostility. Envy, they say, is a prison of one's own making, and Saul found himself ensnared within its confines. His inability to rejoice in the success of others and his fixation on his own insecurity transformed the court into a cauldron of intrigue and treachery. Yet, amidst the tumult, I remained steadfast in my faith, unwavering in my commitment to serve the Lord and his people. Saul's envy manifested in reckless acts of aggression, as he sought to snuff out my life on two separate occasions, even as I played the harp to soothe his troubled soul. But by the grace of God, I narrowly escaped his wrath, evading the deadly spear aimed at my heart. It became evident that my presence within the court was no longer tenable, marking the onset of a perilous journey fraught with trials and tribulations, where only the Lord's providence would safeguard me. Yet, amidst the tumult of uncertainty, I clung to the unwavering certainty that the battles I fought were not merely against moral adversaries but against the spiritual forces that sought to derail God's divine plan for Israel. Through the tempest of envy and conspiracy, my spirit remained anchored in the assurance that ultimate victory belonged to the Lord alone, transcending the limitations of earthly power and human machinations. In the crucible of adversity, I gleaned profound lessons on the nature of true greatness, not in the pursuit of power or acclaim but in steadfast adherence to one's convictions and unwavering obedience to God's will. Though Saul's malice inflicted deep wounds upon my soul, it also served as a crucible, forging within me the qualities requisite for leadership, humility, integrity, and an unwavering reliance on divine guidance. Amidst the labyrinthine intrigues of the court, where alliances were forged and broken with the caprice of the wind, love blossomed like a fragile flower amidst the thorns. Michael, Saul's daughter, emerged as a beacon of light amidst the encroaching darkness of courtly intrigue. Her love for me kindled a spark that would bind our fates inexorably to the tapestry of the royal household. Though Saul recognized his daughter's affection for me, he viewed it not as an opportunity for unity but as a weapon to wield against me. His demand for a bright price of a hundred Philistine foreskins bespoke not of paternal love but of spiteful malice. Saul, the king of Israel, harbored a deep-seated animosity toward me, David, because he perceived me as a threat to his reign. Despite my loyal service to him, Saul's jealousy and fear consumed him leading him to devise sinister plots against my life. Yet, amidst the perilous schemes and treachery, my faith in the Almighty remained unshaken. The ordeal began when Saul offered me a perilous task, hoping it would lead to my demise. However, trusting in the providence of the Lord and driven by a genuine love for my friend Jonathan, I accepted the challenge. Though Saul believed it would lead to my demise, my trust in the Lord was unwavering. The task was to procure 100 Philistine foreskins as a bride price for Michael, Saul's daughter, whom I loved dearly. Yet, I surpassed Saul's expectations by presenting him with double the required number, a testament to my commitment and determination. My union with Michael was not merely a union of hearts but also a symbol of defiance against Saul's tyranny. As we exchanged vows, the tumultuous political landscape of Israel loomed large, casting a shadow over our happiness. Uncertainty clouded my future as I navigated the treacherous corridors of Saul's court, where loyalty was fleeting, and danger lurked at every corner. Michael's unwavering loyalty and courage were a beacon of hope amid the storm of adversity. When Saul's agents were dispatched to slay me within the confines of my own abode, 
it was Michael who intervened, risking her own safety to ensure my escape. Her act of selflessness forged an unbreakable bond between us, strengthening our resolve to weather the storms that lay ahead. However, our love was not immune to the machinations of Saul, who viewed me as a threat to his reign. His attempts to undermine our union through political maneuvering only served to deepen our resolve. Despite Saul's efforts to separate us, our love endured, a testament to the enduring power of love amidst adversity. As tensions escalated, Saul's hostility towards me reached a fever pitch. Fueled by envy and paranoia, he sought to eliminate me by any means necessary. His first attempt came during a fit of rage, where he hurled a spear in my direction, intent on ending my life. Though I narrowly escaped, the incident served as a grim harbinger of the perils that lay ahead. Saul's descent into madness only escalated as time passed, leading him to issue decrees calling for my execution. Yet, amidst the chaos, Jonathan, Saul's own son and my dear friend, remained a steadfast ally. His unwavering support and advocacy served as a beacon of hope amidst the darkness that enveloped Saul's court. Despite Jonathan's efforts to reason with his father and plead for my innocence, Saul's heart remained hardened, consumed by his insatiable thirst for power. His relentless pursuit of me forced me into hiding, where I lived under constant fear of discovery. Throughout the ordeal, Michael remained my steadfast companion her unwavering support and courage serving as a source of strength. Her sacrifice, forsaking her own safety to ensure mine, underscored the depth of her love and devotion. In the face of Saul's relentless persecution, I clung to my faith in the Almighty, trusting that His divine providence would guide me through the darkness. Though the path ahead was fraught with peril, I remained steadfast in my resolve, knowing that the Lord was with me every step of the way. Ahimelech, the priest, bestowed upon me sustenance in the formidable sword of Goliath, unaware of the storm his act of benevolence would incite among himself and his fellow priests. Seeking refuge, I sought solace in Nob, fleeing from the wrath that brewed behind me. When Saul, the king, caught wind of Ahimelech's assistance, he ordered the execution of Ahimelech and the priests of Nob, plunging his reign into a dark epoch. The weight of this deed bore heavily upon my conscience, fortifying my resolve to remain steadfast in the face of persecution. Amidst the harsh expanse of the desert, I sought shelter within caverns, relying upon the allegiance of an increasing multitude of dispossessed and disheartened souls who gravitated towards me. Though the journey was arduous, it also served as a crucible for profound personal and spiritual growth. Witnessing the guiding hand of the Almighty amidst tribulation, I forged a newfound trust in the Lord, surpassing all previous bounds of faith. The zenith of my odyssey arrived amidst the precipice of despair, as the earth seemed poised to crumble beneath my feet. Yet, in that very moment, a remarkable transformation began to unfold. Initially a solitary fugitive, I gradually amassed a band of followers, assuming leadership over them. Each individual harbored their own tale of sorrow and despondency, yet found within me a beacon worth following. Together, we sought refuge in the caverns of Adullam, a seemingly improbable sanctuary for those marginalized during Saul's reign. In the years preceding, I had endured ceaseless persecution, bereft of much-needed succor. Yet, in that hour of dire need, I beheld a diverse assembly, the destitute, the aggrieved, and the afflicted. Numbering around four hundred, these disparate souls, bound not by blood but by belief in my leadership, sought justice in a brighter future. This congregation of the forsaken swiftly evolved into a potent force, impossible to overlook, owing to the manner in which I guided them. With time, they transcended the adversities posed by both the desert terrain and the pursuers who dogged our steps, emerging as a cohesive fraternity, a familial cohort dedicated to a cause greater than any individual among them. 
the formation of this collective marked a pivotal juncture in my life. In addition to imparting lessons on leadership and justice, I instilled within them the significance of unwavering faith amidst adversity. In return for their benevolence, they proffered their unyielding support, their valor, and the assurance that our struggle against injustice was not in vain. Ascending to the throne of Israel, I endeavored to enshrine these principles into governance, endeavoring to establish a new order founded upon integrity and mutual respect. Initially deemed societal outcasts, these men proved indispensable to me, evolving into my most trusted advisors, my stalwart champions, and my closest confidants throughout my military campaigns. As long as they stood by my side, I wielded the capacity to enact deeds that solidified my renown within Israel and beyond. With every triumph and act of valor, our bonds grew stronger, attesting to the righteousness of our cause. In an unexpected turn of events, I found myself seeking refuge among the Philistines, my former adversaries. This twist of fate unfolded despite my previous triumph over the giant Goliath, a prominent Philistine figure. My journey toward this decision was heavily influenced by King Saul's relentless pursuit, which, coupled with his kingdom's might and resources, exerted mounting pressure upon me. The weight of these circumstances forced me to make choices that, to many, might have seemed unthinkable. This decision was a calculated risk, a strategic maneuver born out of desperation, aimed at safeguarding not only my own life, but also the lives of those who stood with me. I was acutely aware of the perils awaiting me as I approached Achish, the king of Gath. My reputation as the conqueror of the Philistines preceded me, and the memory of Goliath loomed large in their collective consciousness. Despite this, I managed to sway Achish by feigning allegiance to him and presenting myself as a refugee fleeing Saul's pursuit. Armed with experience and self-assurance, I adeptly navigated the treacherous waters of diplomacy and deceit. I offered Achish my services, pledging protection in exchange for sanctuary and resources. Recognizing the potential advantages of my presence, Achish granted me a stronghold in Ziklag. This act of generosity not only provided me with a safe haven but also afforded me a strategic vantage point from which to operate. In Ziklag, I established a refuge for my family and followers, situated beyond Saul's immediate reach. To maintain my position and Akish trust, I had to employ a delicate balance of cunning and dissimulation. During my tenure among the Philistines, I led numerous raids, ostensibly against Israel's enemies. However, my true targets were those who opposed God's will. By defeating the Amalekites and other hostile tribes, I not only bolstered my own standing but also served the interests of my people. Concealing these genuine motives from Achish, I duped him into believing that my loyalty and actions were directed against Israel. The tumultuous period in Israel's history came to a close with the tragic demise of Saul and his sons in battle. This pivotal moment marked the beginning of a new chapter in my personal journey. The demise of King Saul, the Lord's anointed, atop Mount Gilboa, alongside his valiant sons, including my beloved friend Jonathan, stirred a myriad of emotions and sparked profound reflections on destiny, loyalty, and divine providence. In the culmination of a violent conflict waged in Gilboa against the Philistines, Israel endured a harrowing defeat. Saul, facing the impending shame of defeat, opted to take his own life. His decision epitomized a profound despair and an ongoing struggle against forces seemingly beyond his control. Among the casualties of this tragic battle were Saul's valiant sons, including Jonathan, who nobly sacrificed their lives to defend their people and their kingdom. The loss of Jonathan struck me deeply. He wasn't merely a reliable ally but also a kindred spirit, our bond untouched by the hardships we faced or the complexities of our positions. His passing brought both immense sorrow and a renewed commitment to honor his memory and the principles he stood for, even in death. 
With Saul's demise, a chapter defined by strife and persecution closed, paving the way for the fulfillment of the Lord's promises to me and my family. Yet, my ascent to power was tinged with sorrow rather than joy, weighed down by the burden of responsibility and mourning for the fallen. I understood that uniting Israel and restoring its strength would be formidable tasks, demanding intelligence, compassion, and unwavering reliance on divine guidance. I acted to honor Saul's memory and ensure a transition of power that would mend past wounds and lead Israel toward a brighter future. My public mourning for Saul and his sons served as a testament to my reverence for the departed king and my empathy for my fellow citizens, even those who were once adversaries. My journey toward leadership took a divine turn after Saul's death, propelled not by personal ambition but by recognition from the people of Judah, who saw in me a capable leader to navigate the challenges ahead. In Hebron, amidst its rich historical and spiritual significance, I was anointed as King of Judah, marking not only the beginning of my reign but also a new era for God's people. This decision wasn't arbitrary, it came after prayerful guidance, affirming Hebron as the starting point for my journey. The anointing in Hebron symbolized not only my leadership but also God's faithfulness to His promises. Though many celebrated my ascent to the throne of Judah, it also signaled a period of transition and adversity. I ruled over the southern kingdom while the northern part remained loyal to Saul's dynasty, reflecting the intricate power dynamics and divided loyalties within Israel, challenges I knew I must navigate with wisdom and prudence. As I ascended to the throne of Judah, the weight of responsibility settled upon my shoulders like a heavy cloak. The people looked to me not only as their king but also as a beacon of justice, mercy, and fidelity to God's will. My journey to kingship was marked not only by the battles against the Philistines and the trials fleeing from Saul's pursuit but also by the profound humility and unwavering reliance on the Almighty that formed the bedrock of my authority. The anointing ceremony in Hebron was a pivotal moment, a divine confirmation of my calling to lead Judah in righteousness. It was there, amidst the solemn rituals and the whispers of the faithful, that I felt the weight of history upon me. The anointing oil, poured over my head, symbolized not just my ascent to power but also the sacred duty that accompanied it, the duty to govern with integrity, to champion the cause of the oppressed, and to seek unity and peace among all the tribes of Israel. Yet, even as I grappled with the challenges of my early reign, a momentous event unfolded that would reshape the course of Israel's history, the alliance with Abner, the esteemed commander of Ishbosheth's army. Abner, a stalwart loyalist to the house of Saul, had long been a formidable adversary, his military prowess matched only by his unwavering dedication to his leech. The tensions simmering within the northern kingdom, the lingering rivalries and resentments, finally erupted into open discord, driving a wedge between Abner and Ishbosheth. It was then that Abner, driven by a sense of disillusionment and a longing for recognition, sought an audience in my court. His decision to cast his lot with me was not made lightly, it was a seismic shift in the political landscape of Israel, a testament to the waning influence of Saul's house and the rising tide of my own authority. In Hebron, amidst the ancient stones and the murmurs of history, our alliance was sealed. Abner pledged his allegiance to me, promising to wield his considerable influence and military acumen to sway the hearts of the northern tribes. It was a moment fraught with significance, a turning point in Israel's fortunes, as erstwhile adversaries became allies in the pursuit of a common cause. And so, from the hallowed halls of Hebron, the echoes of our alliance reverberated across the land, heralding a new era of unity and purpose for the people of Israel. The path ahead was fraught with challenges and uncertainties, but with Abner at my side, I faced the future with confidence, knowing that together, we would fulfill the divine mandate entrusted to us, to lead God's chosen people with justice, mercy, and unwavering faith. In response, I offered Abner reassurance, promising him honor and a significant role under my reign. 
as our pact was sealed, marking the beginning of a transitional period, a process of reconciliation commenced across Israel, gradually uniting the kingdom under a single leadership. Following Saul's passing, Israel found itself embroiled in a series of conflicts and power struggles, mirroring the internal divisions and tensions within the nation. During my establishment as king in Judah, situated in Hebron, Saul's lineage grappled to maintain control over the northern tribes of Israel. Abner, the stalwart commander of Saul's army, took charge, anointing Ishbosheth, Saul's son, as the monarch of Israel, with his court stationed in Mahanaim. The division of the kingdom between the descendants of David and Saul sowed the seeds for a prolonged era marked by animosity and political maneuvering, as both factions fight to consolidate their influence and assert authority over the entire nation. Beyond a mere struggle for temporal power, the conflict between the houses of David and Saul bore witness to the complexities of familial loyalties, political aspirations, and the divine designs for the people of Israel. Saul's lineage, led by Ishbosheth and Abner, fiercely resisted my endeavors to unite the tribes under a singular ruler, aligned with the divine will. Fearing the loss of their stature and jurisdiction, they adamantly opposed my unifying efforts. The clashes between our respective forces were numerous and often brutal. Notably, the Battle of Gibeon saw Joab, my valiant commander, lock horns with Abner's warriors, a pivotal engagement in our ongoing struggles. This particular conflict exemplified the arduous quest for sovereignty over Israel, resulting in losses on both sides and further exacerbating tensions between the rival governmental entities. Yet, beneath the surface skirmishes lay a deeper contest for legitimacy and the rightful authority to govern in accordance with God's will. Simultaneously, as I endeavored to consolidate my rule in Judah and extend my influence over Israel through diplomacy and alliance building, Saul's household grappled with preserving its legacy and relevance amidst a swiftly evolving landscape. The conflict that had long plagued the land of Israel finally saw a glimmer of resolution when Abner, a prominent figure among the northern tribes, made the decisive choice to align himself with my cause. His pledge of support carried with it the weight of assurance, promising the backing of the northern tribes, thus tipping the scales in favor of unity. This pivotal moment, though laden with potential for peace, was tragically marred by the hand of violence. For it was Joab, driven by his own agenda, who inflicted a fatal blow upon Abner, casting a shadow of doubt and instability over the fragile alliance that had begun to take root. The repercussions of Abner's untimely demise rippled through the fabric of our nascent unity, threatening to unravel the progress made toward reconciliation. Yet, even amidst the darkness of betrayal and bloodshed, the divine hand of providence continued to guide the destiny of Israel. The culmination of these tumultuous events heralded the dawn of a new era for God's chosen people. As I stood anointed as king over all Israel, the significance of the moment was not lost upon me. It represented more than mere consolidation of power, it was a divine affirmation of leadership ordained by the Almighty Himself. The journey toward unification, fraught with obstacles and opposition, had finally reached its zenith. The elders of Israel, recognizing the hand of God upon me, converged upon Hebron to pledge their allegiance and support. In their acknowledgement of our shared heritage and divine calling, they forged a covenant of unity that transcended tribal loyalties and ancient grievances. Thus, in the hallowed halls of Hebron, the disparate strands of Israel's fractured identity were woven together into a tapestry of collective purpose and destiny. The anointing as king not only marked the end of discord but also served as a clarion call to action. With unity restored, my gaze turned toward the ancient city of Jerusalem, its towering walls standing as a testament to centuries of defiance against the God of Israel. The conquest of Jerusalem was not merely a military endeavor, it was a spiritual odyssey imbued with profound significance. 
As the city of David fell under Israelite rule, its capture symbolized the triumph of faith over adversity and the establishment of Jerusalem as the beating heart of the unified monarchy. With the Ark of the Covenant brought into its midst, Jerusalem was transformed into more than just a political capital, it became a sacred sanctuary, a beacon of divine presence amidst a world shrouded in darkness. The selection of Jerusalem as the seat of power was not arbitrary but rather a deliberate act of homage to the covenant forged between God and His people. From the vantage point of Jerusalem's lofty heights, I embarked upon campaigns of expansion and conquest, securing the borders of Israel against external threats and ushering in an era of unprecedented prosperity and stability. The territories gained through these endeavors served not only to extend Israel's influence but also to cement my authority as the rightful ruler chosen by divine decree. As the boundaries of Israel expanded, so too did its wealth and influence, attracting traders and merchants from distant lands and solidifying our position as a beacon of prosperity in a world plagued by strife and uncertainty. Thus, from the ashes of discord arose a united and resplendent Israel, guided by the hand of providence and destined for greatness. One of the most significant acts in terms of both national and spiritual significance was the monumental journey of bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. For a considerable amount of time, the Ark had found its resting place in the home of Abinadab in Kiriath Jerim, serving as a tangible symbol of God's presence among his people. The decision to relocate it to Jerusalem stemmed from a deep desire to centralize worship and to reaffirm Israel's faith in the Lord as the very cornerstone of their national identity. The voyage of the Ark to Jerusalem was not merely a logistical endeavor but a sacred procession marked by jubilation and reverence. However, amidst the festivities, there arose an incident that served as a sobering reminder of the need for utmost care and reverence in handling such a sacred artifact. It was a moment that instilled in me a profound sense of humility and caution. Upon reaching the city of David, the Ark found its new abode, signifying the heavenly favor and protective mantle that would encompass my reign and the destiny of Israel. This relocation held immense significance, symbolizing the unity of the people under the divine authority of God and solidifying Jerusalem as the spiritual and political epicenter of the nation. The establishment of the Davidic Covenant stands as a pivotal moment in both my personal journey and in the annals of Israel's history. This sacred covenant was forged through a divine revelation delivered by the prophet Nathan, wherein God pledged to establish my lineage and kingdom for all eternity. This promise transcended my individual reign, extending through generations, ultimately culminating in the advent of the Messiah who would establish an everlasting kingdom. Through the covenant, God reaffirmed His unwavering commitment to Israel and my lineage, forging a unique bond between Himself and His chosen people. This covenant bore far-reaching implications that surpassed the confines of time and history, underscoring the eternal nature of God's covenantal relationship with His people. The period marked by conflicts with the Ammonites and the Syrians tested the resilience of Israel's security and its capacity for expansion. Provoked by aggression from the Ammonites, my envoys found themselves embroiled in a series of wars, facing not only the Ammonites but also their Syrian allies. These tumultuous conflicts showcased the military prowess and strategic acumen of Israel, as we engaged in fierce battles to defend our sovereignty and expand our territories. Through the divine intervention and blessing of God, we emerged triumphant, securing decisive victories that not only quelled the aggression of our adversaries but also solidified Israel's dominance over vital territories. These victories bolstered the strength and prosperity of our nation, ensuring its continued growth and safeguarding its borders from external threats. The transgression involving Bathsheba remains a poignant chapter in my life, fraught with remorse and repentance. In a moment of weakness, I succumbed to the allure of a woman who was not my wife, allowing myself to be ensnared by the trappings of power and desire. 
My actions led me down a path of deceit and betrayal, culminating in a grievous sin committed against both God and Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, a loyal and honorable soldier in my army. I, David, the shepherd boy anointed by the prophet Samuel to become king over Israel, recount the solemn tale of my confrontation with the weight of my own sinfulness. It was the prophet Nathan, a vessel of God's wisdom and righteousness, who was dispatched to me to unveil the mirror of truth before my eyes. In his words, divinely inspired, I found no refuge from the piercing light of accountability. The encounter with Nathan was not merely a passing moment, it was a profound reckoning, an unveiling of the depths of my transgressions. My soul quivered under the weight of realization as the severity of my actions unfolded before me. The gravity of my sin cast a shadow over my consciousness, shattering the illusion of impunity that had veiled my heart. Consequences, grave and unyielding, followed in the wake of my disobedience. The tendrils of my wrongdoing reached out, ensnaring not only my own fate but also the destinies of those closest to me, my beloved family. Their anguish became the bitter fruit of my iniquity, as pain and death infiltrated the sanctity of our household. Oh, the anguish of a father's heart as I beheld the desecration of my daughter Tamar, her innocence tarnished by the vile acts of her own flesh and blood, Amnon, my son. My spirit groaned within me, stricken by the agony of helplessness, as I witnessed the violation of her purity. The silence that gripped my tongue in those moments of horror echoed with the deafening clamor of my failure to protect. But the tempest of tragedy did not abate with the violation of Tamar, it burgeoned into a maelstrom of fraternal strife. Absalom, consumed by the flames of righteous indignation, nursed a festering wound of hatred in his heart, ignited by the flames of injustice. His fury, a reflection of my own impotence, erupted in a tempest of vengeance, culminating in the bloodshed of Amnon, his brother. The threads of discord and treachery, woven by the loom of my sins, entwined themselves around the fabric of my family, tearing at the seams of kinship. Absalom's revolt, a specter of betrayal haunting the halls of my authority, rent the bonds of paternal affection asunder. The bitter taste of betrayal, mingled with the salt of tears, stained the memory of our shared heritage. The exodus from Jerusalem, my beloved city, became the bitter chalice of my affliction, poured out by the hand of my own flesh and blood. Absalom, driven by ambition and the hunger for power, orchestrated a symphony of rebellion that reverberated through the corridors of power. Forced to flee the seat of my sovereignty, I became a wanderer in the land that once hailed me as king. The loss of Absalom, my son, was a wound that cut deeper than the edge of the sword. His demise, a bitter victory won amidst the clash of armies, left a chasm in my soul that no victory could fill. The echo of his absence reverberated through the chambers of my heart, a haunting lament for the son I had lost to the ravages of ambition. But the trials of my reign did not end with the death of Absalom, they continued to assail me, relentless in their pursuit. Sheba, a Benjamite, kindled the embers of rebellion, igniting a conflagration of dissent in the heart of my kingdom. Though swiftly quelled, the rebellion served as a somber reminder of the fissures that marred the unity of Israel, as well as the scars that marred the tapestry of my reign. Each trial, each tribulation, etched its mark upon the canvas of my soul, a testament to the frailty of power and the imperatives of justice and mercy. Through the crucible of adversity, I gleaned the wisdom that only hardship can impart, learning the true measure of leadership. Humility, forgiveness, and reconciliation became the guiding stars that illuminated the path of my governance, leading me back to the embrace of divine grace. In the twilight of my reign, as the sands of time slipped through my fingers, I found myself once more at the crossroads of destiny. The decision to conduct the census of Israel and Judah, born of pride and folly, stood as a testament to the frailty of human ambition. In my hubris, I sought solace in the numbers of men, 
forsaking the solace of faith in the providence of God. The consequences of my folly were swift and merciless, as a plague descended upon the land, claiming the lives of seventy thousand souls. The weight of their deaths, a burden too heavy for mortal shoulders to bear, pressed upon my heart with the force of a mountain. In the depths of despair, I cried out to the heavens, pleading for mercy and forgiveness. Thus, in the annals of history, I, David, stand as a testament to the complexities of the human condition, a flawed vessel navigating the currents of divine providence. My triumphs and tribulations alike bear witness to the inexorable march of time, weaving a tapestry of redemption and regret. And though the shadows of my sins may linger, I take solace in the boundless mercy of the Almighty, whose grace knows no bounds. In the throes of suffering and repentance, I found myself compelled to take action. I resolved to acquire the threshing floor belonging to Aaron of the Jebusite, intending to erect an altar upon it dedicated to the Lord, beseeching His forgiveness and compassion. Though the affliction of the virus eventually abetted, its lessons lingered in my consciousness, etching themselves into the fabric of my being for all time to come. Turning my gaze from the past, I fixated upon a cherished dream that had nestled in the recesses of my heart for countless years, the erection of a temple for the Lord in the heart of Jerusalem. Amidst contemplation of my past deeds and their reverberations, this vision loomed large. Though it became clear that the task of overseeing this monumental endeavor would not be mine to fulfill, but rather that of my son Solomon, I poured forth every ounce of my being into clearing the path for his success. Gold, silver, bronze, and timber were amassed, along with skilled artisans, all in preparation for the grand construction that would commence after my earthly departure. This preparation, while undeniably an expression of my unwavering devotion to the Almighty, served as a herald of change, marking the culmination of my journey and the dawn of Solomon's reign. Sensing the sands of time slipping through my fingers, I summoned Solomon to impart unto him my final directives for the governance of Israel with wisdom and equity. Advising him to remain steadfast in adherence to the statutes and ordinances of the Lord, I urged him to tread the paths laid down by divine wisdom. In earnest supplication, I beseeched that Solomon would oversee the construction of the temple, a sanctuary to stand as a perpetual testament to the abiding presence of the Almighty among his people. My soul yearned to witness the continued prosperity of Israel under Solomon's stewardship, and I lifted fervent prayers for its realization. As the curtains drew close on my mortal existence, it marked not merely the conclusion of an era, but the genesis of another. My legacy, a tapestry woven with triumphs and tribulations, sins and contrition, serves as a testament to the unyielding faithfulness of God, even amidst the frailty of humanity. For we are enjoined to seek the Almighty with unflagging devotion, trusting in His boundless mercy and grace to navigate the tempests of life. My life, an intricately woven narrative of trials and redemptions, serves as a poignant reminder that despite our failings, our primary duty is to seek the divine. Thus, I, David, recount the chronicles of my existence a man after God's own heart.